morning, everyone. I'm Eric Galanik here at the Saugatuck Douglas History Center in Douglas. Um, and we'd like to welcome you to our Tuesday talk today, the Great Lakes Region, Why the Great Lakes Are So Great with Ashley Deming. The mission of the Saugatuck Douglas History Center is to preserve local history and inspire learning to inform and improve our community. Founded as the Saugatuck Douglas Historical Society, in 1986, we are a volunteer-run organization, 700 members strong, that saves and shares the stories of our community. This program today is sponsored uh, by longtime Tuesday Talk supporters and History Center members Doug and Debbie West. If you would like to sponsor SDHC programs, please contact me after the program. We also receive support from the Michigan Council for the Arts and Cultural Affairs, as well as the National Endowment for the Arts. We also receive support from the Allegan County Community Foundation and from members like you. Uh, if you'd like to become a member, you can join online uh, and we appreciate your support in all that we do. We have a couple of additional programs coming up in the next two weeks. Uh, next Tuesday, we will be meeting for our last Tuesday talk in person outdoors at the garden at the, Sa at the History Center in Douglas. Uh, this program on Saugatuck artist John Holka will be presented by SDHC board member and collection manager Ken Kotzel. Uh, so you'll definitely want to see that 11 a.m. Uh, here in the garden in person. Uh, this Thursday on August the 26th, we will have a program in conjunction with the Saugatuck Douglas Fenville Arts Initiative. This is uh, an artist talk with Jason Quigno, Grand Rapids sculptor and guest curator of the exhibit, Art of the People, Contemporary Anishinaabe Arts. Uh, that's at the schoolhouse this summer and fall. Uh, that program will be at 7 p.m. in person in the garden. It is free to attend. We do ask you to bring a camp chair or outdoor chair if you uh, would like for, uh, for comfort. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, we have uh, our opening for uh, A Century of Progress, 100 Years of LGBTQ History in Saugatuck Douglas. Um, the exhibit opens Labor Day weekend on Saturday, September 4th. There is a preview party. Tickets are going fast for that. So uh, if you would like to attend that on Friday, September the 3rd, uh, please uh, contact me by email or phone or visit our website. You can buy tickets directly on there. It is a ticketed event uh, for that. Uh, it should be a, a fabulous evening and event and a first chance to get to see that exhibit in person. Uh, the exhibit will be open uh, through the next year uh, and we're really excited about that. Um, Without further ado, though, uh, we're going to turn our attention to today's program on the history of uh, the Great Lakes uh, with Ashley Deming. Ashley Deming is Director of Education and Administration for South Haven's Michigan Maritime Museum since 2015. She obtained her BA in Anthropology from Western Michigan University, then worked as Education and Outreach Specialist at Thunder Bay National Maritime Sanctuary in Alpena, Michigan. She then went on to earn an MA in Maritime History and Archaeology from the University of Bristol in Bristol, England, and returned to become an underwater archaeologist for the state of South Carolina from 2010 to 2015. She brings more than a decade of experience in the field of maritime heritage and archaeology, public education, and outreach uh, to us today. We're thrilled to have you uh, from just down the road. Uh, and telling stories from really uh, international connections and perspectives on the Great Lakes. Uh, so with that, uh, a warm welcome to you, Ashley. Thank you very much, Eric. I'm happy to be here today with everyone and talk a little bit about the Great Lakes. Michigan is my home state. And even after living in a variety of places, I just couldn't get that nice fresh water out of my system. So I had to come home and uh, do a little bit more here uh, in the beautiful Great Lakes because there really is no place like it on earth. So I hope all of you feel the same that are joining us here today. 
So we're just going to talk a little bit about why the Great Lakes are so great. There's some fun facts, um, talk a little bit about the types of vessels, and then we'll finish up a little bit with uh, the museum itself and uh, what we offer here at the Michigan Maritime Museum, just a stone's throw from uh, Saugatuck Douglas. So let's see if it'll let me move forward in my presentation. Okay, some fun facts. The name uh, of Michigan, if many of you don't know, actually comes from the Ojibwe word of Michigama, meaning large water or large lake. Uh, certainly we have a lot of those. They really more are like inland seas uh, with a total surface area of over 95,000 square miles. That is fantastic. Uh, 3,288 miles of actual coastline and 20% of the world's fresh water. I didn't even know what a quadrillion was uh, as a unit of measurement that seems crazy to me, but six quadrillion gallons of water, of fresh water here in our Great Lakes. Uh, if we were to kind of drain the Great Lakes out of the basin, it would be enough water to cover uh, North and South America in a foot of water. That's pretty substantial. Uh, the Great Lakes borders seven states and one Canadian province, that province being Ontario, uh, and it contains 35,000 islands. Uh, Manitoulin Island in Lake Huron is the largest island uh, in a freshwater lake in the world. So we have a lot of those claims to fame uh, here in, uh, in the Great Lakes. All right, some very interesting lake facts as far as depth, and you can see the distance between the highest uh, lake that we have geographically, which is Lake Superior, all the way out to the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, of course, all of our Great Lakes, many of you know, uh, are, were formed by glaciers and the recession of those glaciers. We're actually still rebounding from the weight of that glacier over Michigan. So we have a basin uh, here in Michigan that was 10,000 years ago that they started to recede. Lake Superior is the largest freshwater lake in the world. Um, that's pretty substantial. Uh, and it's also very deep at about 1300 feet. Um, and uh, Lake Michigan is actually the only lake that is uh, out of the Great Lakes that's entirely within the bounds of the United States. And that's gonna come into play a little bit when we talk about uh, World War II here later in the presentation. fishing. I mean, we can't talk about the Great Lakes without talking about uh, fishing. We have a wide variety of species here, uh, 177 fish species, 139 of which are native to the Great Lakes. And then we have 34 non-native species. And we're going to say non-native because not all non-native species are invasive species. So we'll talk a little bit uh, briefly about that too. Uh, the largest fish is the lake sturgeon, but there are many other fish that we know about popular for recreational fishing, salmon, walleye, trout, muskie, um, and other species like that. Lake whitefish, walleye, perch, and cisco make up the most, uh, made up the most of commercial fishery, even the one that's currently existing. There aren't many commercial fishing licenses out there anymore. Um, tribal fisheries uh, have probably the most, uh, not licenses, but are fishing the most um, in that way for commercially. And most of the commercial fishing is happening farther northern Lake Michigan, Huron and Superior is, is where it's focused. And that has to do a lot with the fish populations that we have, the strain that has been put on the fish populations uh, historically, so that we can have a sustainable fishery. So commercial recreational and tribal fisheries are collectively valued at more than $7 billion annually uh, and support more than $75,000 or 75,000 jobs, uh, which is pretty substantial uh, here in the Great Lakes for our economy. All right, so talking a little bit about those invasive species. Uh, many of you have probably been walking the beach and uh, unfortunately come in contact with uh, the zebra mussel, which you can see there in the upper left of your screen. Uh, these are invasive species that were brought in uh, prior to our knowledge and um, plans for stopping invasive species, but they came in actually in the ballast of uh, vessels uh, that were coming over cargo vessels that were coming over from uh, Asia and uh, Europe. So when the ballast was released, that water ballast was released, these zebra mussels were released into our system. They've taken over. Uh, they have a cousin, the quagga mussel, which is a little bit bigger, can travel a little bit deeper in the water column, and they're also taking over. So um, they are invasive. That's why they're called invasive species. Uh, we have several different types of carp 
that are invasive species to the Great Lakes. In Lake Michigan, um, we've been a little bit lucky to so far escape the Asian carp as an invasive species. They have found DNA of the carp here in Lake Michigan. Um, so it's probably only a matter of time and we'll just you know, keep doing our best to try and uh, fight that because they will uh, take over and it really will impact the native populations that we have here in the Great Lakes. Um, of course, the sea lamprey, that's played a major role when it uh, comes to the collapse of commercial fishing here uh, in the Great Lakes. You can see the lamprey attached there to the fish. Um, they have little teeth, they're able to suck out nutrients and fluids from the fish, and then the, they can see the one that's actually attached to the gill. So it, as soon as the fish kind of eats and is processing those nutrients, uh, the lamprey can basically steal that food. So they have a huge impact on fish populations. Um, have really hurt lake trout quite a bit. Um, and uh, there are some mitigation processes that the Michigan DNR are uh, working on for lake trout, have been for quite some time to try and keep the population from absolutely exploding. So we'll see what happens with that, but certainly has affected our uh, fish populations and then our ability to fish commercially for some species. Speaking of historic commercial fishing, of course, it was a very predominant industry in the Great Lakes in the 19th and 20th centuries. Started out uh, more with uh, lake trout and whitefish. We have perch, cisco, which is lake herring, for some of you that are familiar with that, uh, and chubs. So those all became popular commercial fish. Um, there was a high demand on fisheries during World War II. Uh, we wanted to feed American populations with American food products. So uh, actually commercial fishermen were exempt from the draft in World War II because they were considered essential. Um, and I think after the pandemic, we can all kind of understand what essential employees are now. Um, and that was very much the, the same way during World War II. Um, and they were fishing for America. So the, uh, the strain on the fish populations was quite great as a result of that. Um, invasive species uh, started coming in as well. So we had some issues with uh, invasive species. And then because of the industrialization um, really kicking off in World War II with what we were producing here uh, at home and in Michigan, in the Great Lakes region, was we have a lot of natural resources. Um, it affected fish populations. And so slowly we see really the end of commercial fishing in the 70s, early 80s here in the Great Lakes. We had to, in because of the changes in the fish populations, um, the state of Michigan and other surrounding states, their uh, department, we'll call them the Department of Natural Resources uh, now, um, made some changes on how we might be able to bounce back some of those uh, fish populations. And there is a trend of that, it just takes a long time. Um, so there had to be changes in the types of nets used, the types of boats used, and most of these commercial uh, fishing industries or businesses were family run, they were smaller with the changes uh, of having to go farther out in the lake to chase the fish populations to a deeper depth, um, to change their boats, to change their nets, it just became financially unstable for them to be able to do that. And a lot of them uh, ended up going out of business. So by the 1980s, the really the industry had, had completely collapsed um, as they knew it then. So that's why we don't see as much in the commercial fishing industry anymore. Here's some great historic photos of uh, the Jensen Fish House and commercial fishery that was here in South Haven. Um, opened in 1932 uh, and then ran probably one of the longest into the early 80s um, from right next door uh, to the museum. We actually purchased that property from the Jensen family at the end of last year and we're renovating some of their exhibits uh, or their old net sheds and buildings into exhibits, one of which will feature commercial fishing. Um, on the top right, uh, you can see a gentleman, their hardy commercial fisherman, as he's trying to sort out um, a net after storm damage. And then below there is a gill net fish tug. So predominantly a gill net fish tugs are what they were using um, in the 19th and, um, and then in the 20th centuries before they had to change their boat types for more trap net fishing. Um, and that's Evelyn S, which is actually a boat that we have here at the museum and is now an exhibit.
All right, so we have a few more. You can see Evelyn S here, so that was a historic photo. This is Evelyn S uh, now in its uh, dry dock, re-dry dock after the high water uh, we had the last few years, we had to do some high water mitigation uh, for her, um, but she's doing great. She's gonna get a little bit of uh, restoration done on her as with any wooden boat, uh, it needs constant care. So uh, we're gonna continue to take care of Evelyn S. She dates back to 1939, but guests can climb aboard and really see what it was like on a gillnet fish tug uh, from that era. LCJ there is uh, was built in 1945. Uh, it is still owned and operated by the Jensen family. It was a gillnet uh, commercial fish tug. Um, it's been modified a little bit. Now they take charters out. In this particular picture, you're saying, why are there pirates on board? Uh, they participate with our pirate chaser sale with our tall ship. So um, they take uh, folks out and we take folks out. And it's really wonderful that they're, they continue to operate uh, and, from what is now the museum's docks, but the docks with which it has been operating since 1945, keeping that authentic harbor that we're uh, very proud to offer to guests and visitors of the museum. Below that, you can see uh, one of the Jensen Fishery buildings. Um, I absolutely love this building because not a ton of money uh, was put into these kind of buildings and it just shows the um, structure of how those buildings changed throughout time. So you can see the small little gable there was actually one of the original buildings. And then they added the section that was off to the right in the picture. And then later date, they added the section that was off to the left as they grew as a fishery. And you can see some of that structure on the inside. So we're gonna renovate this building for commercial fishing exhibit. Um, and then hopefully be able to keep a lot of those kind of structural uh, bits and pieces, we'll say, um, so you could really kind of see how that changed throughout time, uh, which I find absolutely fascinating. It really tells the story of that building and, and how commercial fishing developed on this site in particular. Um, these vessels, these buildings are all part of the Great Lake Great Lakes Fisheries Heritage Trail. Uh, that's something that does have a website. You can check it out throughout Michigan and the Great Lakes, and it'll have different sites. Uh, also included on that are uh, some museums that talk about commercial fishing, as well as actual working commercial uh, fishing industry that maybe places you go visit or buy fish from, that kind of thing, just to really appreciate that heritage as an important part of our history as Michiganders uh, and our economy. I should say, of course, a little plug for Eric because they just opened a, a commercial fishing uh, exhibit there. Um, there's a short video that is also included in their exhibit that uh, the Michigan Maritime Museum is happy to collaborate with them on that shows a little bit more about historic commercial fishing uh, in the Great Lakes. Okay, uh, Great Lakes vessels. Well, we got to start off with canoes. This is pretty much very typical of uh, the first sorts of boats um, that you're going to see here on the Great Lakes. Um, these were not only uh, Native American canoes. A lot of people use dugouts. It was an easy thing. You could kind of build yourself to be able to get around along the shoreline. So we can see on the right, a sort of a birch bark, more Native American style canoe. This is actually, uh, technically this canoe is made out of fiberglass to make it to look like birch bark, but this is Surrette Nature Center. They actually have two of these um, and they take students out and folks out to have them learn a little bit more about the Voyageur experience. Uh, we were lucky enough to partner with them this year for a STEAM summer camp for kids and get kids out on, uh, on one of these boats, which was such an awesome experience. Um, on the other side, uh, there is a dugout canoe. This is a historic dugout. Um, more modern tools were used for it. It is very old still, and the museum has that on display currently if you wanted to come kind of check that out, but that is a traditional kind of dugout canoe style. Moving right along throughout history, we have tall ships. Uh, next, a variety of tall ships that were built here on the Great Lakes um, or brought in until we had a lock system. We couldn't really get these ships into the upper lakes, you had to build them. The one in the middle is the Michigan Maritime Museum's uh, flagship, Friends Goodwill. That is a replica of a vessel that was built here on the Great Lakes in the River Rouge in 1810 as a merchant vessel. Uh, it was involved uh, in the War of 1812 for troop and supply transport. It was captured by the British. Um, then it was 
under the British control when it fought in the Battle of Lake Erie under a different name. Uh, and then after we won there in the uh, Battle of Lake Erie, it was recaptured by the Americans. Um, and then it was burned in 1814 uh, to, we, we're not sure quite who burned it. The Americans say they burned it to keep it away from the British. The British say they burned it to keep it away from the Americans. Um, it, uh, that was about New Year's Eve, New Year's Day. Um, it was uh, run aground there, kind of caught in a storm and run aground a little bit and, uh, and then burned. So built in 1810, bonfire in 1814, short lived, but a really wonderful example of these types of vessels that were on the Great Lakes during that time period. Um, we continued to use tall ships really um, up through about the 1940s, I would say, or so. Um, they were, as long as they we could sail them and they were sound, they were used mostly for cargo, uh, well, lumber industry, uh, paper industry as well here in South Haven. Um, so lots of uses and then a little bit of passenger uh, use, but mostly as uh, cargo vessels. Steam came along, uh, so we have larger vessels we can operate with, with steam power. Um, a lot of these were passenger vessels. Um, the first exhibit we're going to have in our new facility, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but it's going to be all about passenger steamships. Um, you can see some of these uh, vessels here. We, I picked specifically ones for this presentation that were in and out of South Haven. So we have the city of South Haven passenger steamer there. We have the Theodore Roosevelt, which ran uh, in South Haven, between South Haven and Chicago, maybe a couple other ports until 1941 when the war broke out. And then we have the Eastland. And if you're familiar with the Eastland, uh, this was a passenger vessel that ran between Chicago and South Haven almost exclusively. Um, just day trips for people, bringing them to the resorts here. Uh, this is the height of the resort industry in South Haven and, and smaller places. So we're kind of using South Haven as an example of a port that would be all over the Great Lakes, very similar kind of stories. Um, but the Eastland tragically uh, was going to make it to South Haven for a picnic um, for a, a group, sort of a private charter, if you will. Um, and uh, they think due to some ballast issues with the boat, um, it actually rolled on its side at the dock in Chicago um, and more lives were, passenger lives were lost there than in the Titanic. Um, so pretty tragic end to a, a vessel that made a lot of runs between here and uh, Chicago. Launches. So we've got the steamships that are bringing people into port from the lakes. Then they're met with these wonderful steam launches uh, or electric launches as our Lindy Lou is uh, up there in the top right. Um, and then they're sort of water taxis, if you will. The people will unload their uh, baggage and then people and they'll all get on these and then they'll go farther upriver to their resorts. Um, or they'll just travel around from one side of the you know, river to the other. So these really were uh, very, very popular. Um, all of these pictures are South Haven. So the, the top left that you see there actually is the site of the Michigan Maritime Museum. Uh, now there was a whole amusement park there in the early 1900s. You can see the river launches that they're running. There were other liveries that had launches. Um, our lighthouse keeper Donahue, he and his brother actually had a, a river launch business as well. So very, very popular vessel uh, in that time period. I really appreciate uh, Fatima, the scientific palmist and clairvoyant that was also uh, there at the uh, amusement park too. So um, just a lot of history surrounding uh, these vessels. And then you can see actually the small steam boiler on the, on the bottom picture there uh, that the operator would have used to get these folks to, I think this was Mooney's resort uh, upriver a little bit here in South Haven. We really don't have a lot of those resorts left. That industry kind of, uh, I, it's strange because to say that industry died because obviously we're <laughs> this whole uh, side of like is all about tourism. We have a lot of kind of resorts here still now, but it was a, a bit of a shift in how those resorts operated. So a lot of those um, have gone by the wayside. They don't exist anymore. And we can't talk about the Great Lakes without talking about freighters. Um, we shifted from some of the, the steam, uh, some of these were steam operated at first, and then they moved to you know, different fuels 
um, but much larger vessels on the Great Lakes, steel hulls, we can move a whole bunch of cargo with this, mostly um, raw materials, which is natural resources here in Michigan, the Great Lakes we have a lot of. Um, you can see let's say the far left photo is actually South Haven's Harbor. So you see where the museum is right over the drawbridge uh, there. And then you see that large self unloader um, unloading probably gravel because the site uh, there was actually a concrete plant. So um, there's gravel on that one. Iron ore, this is right down at the docks at South Haven from that transportation company there. Uh, you can see they were actually using a magnet to load and unload the iron ore uh, from the shore onto the boat. Uh, we have whale backs, which are kind of interesting looking uh, cargo vessels on the left, or on, I'm sorry, on the right there. Uh, very popular still on the Great Lakes. And then the Edmund Fitzgerald uh, that was transporting um, taconite pellets. Uh, when it went down in a storm in the 70s. So uh, we're, we still see freighters. I was actually over on Lake Huron a couple weekends ago and the boat traffic, I just couldn't believe it. We don't always see that here on Lake Michigan as much. Um, a lot of it is going up to, the, to Lake Superior uh, and back. We're transporting more things by road <laughs> now and airplane and, and that kind of thing. But it, I mean, I must have seen at least five freighters every single day uh, that I was out there just all day long. It, it was pretty spectacular to still see that industry alive and well. Small craft. So we're getting a little bit more into the recreational uh, craft. On the left is our class racing yacht uh, Bernita. This is a vessel we have at the Michigan Maritime Museum. We just this year are celebrating her 100th birthday, built in 1921. Uh, the she won the Port Huron or Bayview to Mackinac race three times in her career. Uh, first in 1925 for the first ever race again in 1927. Then she was lost to history for quite some time found in a barn restored and sailed again in that race in 2012 and won again. Uh, so pretty spectacular racing a legend and icon here in the Great Lakes. But sailboats, obviously very popular. Uh, we'll move over and these are lightning uh, sailboats, which some of you may actually have owned. Uh, it, it was an incredibly popular uh, vessel in the uh, 40s and 50s. Here in South Haven, we were actually the international headquarters for the lightning class vessels in, uh, 19, in the 1940s. Um, the museum owns one of these as well, flashback, and we'll uh, take it out on occasion. So these were just great little boats, uh, sailboats to have for personal use. And um, really, they mostly ran around in fleets together. So lots of people owned them, and then we kind of raced them and tooled them around uh, in the waterways in a variety of harbors around the Great Lakes. Very popular boat. Small, small craft, uh, we have a snipe that we own. The museum actually has a significant small craft collection, much of which is in storage. So one of those buildings that we're renovating on the uh, historic Jensen property is gonna be for small craft and antique outboard motors. So we're excited to be able to showcase some of these vessels like this beautiful 1950s snipe. Uh, Chris Craft, uh, Lyman, Hacker, some of these wonderful Michigan companies that are building these incredibly beautiful mahogany boats that were very popular. Um, really through the, from the 1920s and even more so into the 1950s at following the war effort when a lot of people were buying boats and had some time for recreation. The vessel that you see uh, on the bottom there is Mary Time. That is our 1929 Chris Craft Cadet. We take people out on that um, as well as part of our on water fleet. So we try to have a, quite a variety of vessels, small craft and larger vessels that are a wonderful representation of all different time periods and models that relate to the Great Lakes specifically. Okay, Great Lakes vessels during World War II. Uh, as I mentioned before, World War II was pretty important here on the Great Lakes with all the natural resources we had, all of the activity that was going on. Um, Lake Michigan in particular had a lot of activity happening because it was the only Great Lake entirely within the United States. They were less concerned about espionage 
as a result because it didn't border another country, that country being Canada. Um, so I think almost 800 vessels were built uh, on Lake Michigan, including troop transport, minesweepers, submarines, which they actually took out the Mississippi River and in the Gulf of Mexico and out. Um, so you can see some of those uh, on the right hand side um, is actually a boat company, Dashiell Carter, that was down in the St. Joe, uh, Benton Harbor area that um, was a boat manufacturer that shifted over for the war effort into making vessels for the war effort. Uh, we can see that in Holland with Chris Craft, they did the same thing. Um, a lot of landing craft came out of uh, Chris Craft. Um, there's some really great books out there that I encourage you to read um, if you get the opportunity to about this and the change for the war effort. Um, we can see the Escanaba, which is actually a Coast Guard vessel uh, that was here in the Great Lakes. Um, that left the Great Lakes uh, and was sunk by a German torpedo. So there's a couple of World War II songs about that. Remember the Escanaba. And then um, on the bottom picture there, we had two aircraft carriers that were used for uh, Navy and Marine pilot training here in the Great Lakes. They were converted steamships. Um, so we had uh, the Greater Buffalo and the CNB. They lopped off the top deck, replaced it with that, that landing platform there. One was made of metal and one was plywood. Uh, on one of those boats, think the Greater Buffalo, they actually shifted the smokestacks. These were side wheel steamers that they converted into these uh, into these training landing craft here, the aircraft carriers. And so the idea was that these were shorter and narrower than your everyday aircraft carrier that's out in the Atlantic and Pacific spheres. And if they could train pilots to take off and land on these smaller uh, aircraft carriers, then they could take off and land anywhere in the, in the world. So that was pretty exciting here on Lake Michigan. Um, and they were based at Navy Pier. Uh, once the war was over, they didn't need these vessels anymore. They were completely scrapped. So there's nothing left of them. The U.S. Life Saving Service and the United States Coast Guard uh, Life Saving Service kind of came first uh, in 1878, uh, and then there, were, there, of course, was the Revenue Cutter Service that existed as well. In 1915, they merged and became what we know now as the United States Coast Guard. Uh, their motto is Semper Paratus, which means always ready. Uh, there are 16 active Coast Guard stations in Michigan right now. Uh, 30 along all of the Great Lakes. So that includes other states. The closest uh, currently is actually St. Joe Station. Holland had a seasonal station. Actually, I think they closed that. And then of course, uh, Grand Haven. So they cover a large area, uh, but they have pretty incredible boats. So they can get here very quickly. We're thrilled to always be able to collaborate uh, and partner with the Coast Guard on our Coast Guard cleanup day. Um, they have joined us, them and the auxiliary, Coast Guard auxiliary have uh, joined us for that uh, annual event for over 20 years now where we polish the brass and clean up our historic Coast Guard vessels um, and honor the past um, as well as getting ready for the season so we can showcase the Coast Guard and Life Saving Service the best that we can here at the Michigan Maritime Museum. In 2019, we celebrated the 80th anniversary of the Coast Guard Auxiliary. So these are volunteers, um, but they are considered active Coast Guard when they're called into service. And that includes their vessels um, that they have registered for the Coast Guard. So they're personal vessels um, that they can use every day. And then when they're called into service or on drills, they are officially part of the, of the military with the Coast Guard. Here's some great pictures. We've got life-saving service there in the middle. Uh, one of the tasks for that life-saving service was to walk the beaches looking for anyone in distress, any boats in distress. They had to clock in at one side, clock in at the other. These were 24 uh, hours a day, seven days a week they would do this. Um, also ran drills and um, all sorts of stuff. We've got a great exhibit on that here at the museum. I encourage you to come visit and learn a little bit more about the U.S. life-saving service. Uh, you can see in the top left, uh, they're doing a drill on a 26 foot uh, surf boat. Um, they used to do drills by going out into the river, hopefully on a nicer day. Um, and then they would flip the boat on purpose and then work to flip it back over so they could keep going out. This isn't a situation where uh, these guys, and it was all men at that time, 
um, could stop and just say, well, I'm wet, I'm cold, I have to, we're just going to return in. They're going out in some of the worst conditions, really bad waves and storms to go save lives. So they have to be able to get those boats righted and keep going out. Um, most of the boats that we have, we have four historic Coast Guard vessels uh, in our exhibit, and then we have one that's in the water um, that's on long-term loan to us, and that's the one in the right, the 36-foot uh, Coast Guard Motor Lifeboat 36460. We really try to showcase the technological changes from the Life Saving Service and into the Coast Guard that really showcases how these boats were built for a very specific purpose. It was built to get out faster and to save more lives. And that's what you can really see with the construction of these vessels. So um, it's a really impressive exhibit to see how we changed. We could have fewer crew, but more survivors uh, that they could, they could save in these boats. And how could they get out there faster and safer? The 36 footer, for example, uh, we've got one inside our Coast Guard building and then this one it has a 2,000 pound bronze keel um, that wants to be on the bottom. So if for some reason it's 30 foot waves, it's crashing storms, this boat can flip over and then it will right itself. So you don't have to spend that time and energy writing itself to continue on. It also, its engine is also in a water uh, tight compartment. So the engine will continue to run as well. And you don't have to stop and waste precious life-saving time trying to get the engine to go or to keep going. So really impressive boats, very cool technology. Um, the image that you can see uh, on the bottom there, the black and white is South Haven Station. They've kind of built a bridge over the, the ramps for the boats there so that people could continue to access the pier. Um, this station was uh, built in the late 1800s uh, on the north side. And then in 1906, they moved the entire station to the south side. And then there was a fire in uh, 1980. It was decommissioned uh, as a Coast Guard station in uh, 73, I think, 1973. And then there was a fire in 1980 that burned it uh, really to the ground. But the, that small little outbuilding that you could kind of see in the back on the right, that survived. Um, and that is now preserved and here on the Michigan Maritime Museum campus. Uh, and that houses our US Life Saving Service exhibit. Excuse me one second while I take a water, drink of water. A lot of what we're seeing now wouldn't be possible with the incredible civil engineering projects that happened on the Great Lakes, such as the canals and the locks. So we have 1825 is when the Erie Canal connected uh, the Atlantic uh, to the lakes through the Hudson River. So now we can get vessels a little bit farther in for those resources as we are expanding uh, a little bit uh, more into the interior of what will be the rest of the United States. In 1829, we have the Welland Canal. This was a big one. Um, this is how we get around Niagara Falls. So now we're opening up uh, the lakes. We can come in through the St. Lawrence Seaway, uh, through Lake Ontario. We can get bigger vessels uh, into this area and, and into Lake Erie, Erie and the Upper Lakes. And then, of course, Michigan becomes a state in the 1830s. Partly, I believe, because of these civil engineering projects that allow us to open up this area to more commerce, more people, more development. In 1855 is when the Sioux locks uh, are created. Uh, it wasn't called the Sioux locks then, um, but uh, that really connected then into Lake Superior uh, and more access again into the interior and those natural resources. So from Lake Superior all the way out to the Atlantic Ocean, there is a total of a 600 foot drop. Um, that means you got to have a lot of locks in order to get up into the Great Lakes and to get down out of those Great Lakes safely with the vessels that we have. So there are actually a total of 16 locks from Lake Superior all the way out uh, to the Atlantic. Really impressive, especially when you think about some of these given the date are done a lot by hand um, and uh, very minimal machinery uh, that they could use in order to do it. Of course, lighthouses are incredibly important Our Great Lakes. Uh, the Great Lakes have an interesting geology that sometimes makes them even harder to navigate than anywhere else. I've heard boat captains say that they would rather take go out on the ocean any day over having to navigate through the Great Lakes. 
Um, we have shallow lakes, they're narrow. Um, as a result, if you get caught in a storm or something, it's pretty hard to not end up running aground or uh, you know, endangering yourself or your vessel in, in some way. So lighthouses are part of what helps to um, avoid such accidents and also for navigation into and out of uh, safe harbors. Michigan has more lighthouses than any other state at 129. Um, and of course, not all lighthouses are houses. Uh, the one we have here in South Haven is technically a beacon. And then the keeper lived in a house uh, farther up on the bluff on the hill uh, to keep an eye on it. So there wasn't anybody living inside the light. It's just a, a beacon there. Only four, <coughs> excuse me, have catwalks. South Haven being one of them, St. Joe has one, um, Manistee has one, and Grand Haven has one. So actually, uh, mostly on Lake Michigan, but uh, all have catwalks. Others did have catwalks historically, but have since been removed. So there's only four that uh, maintain their catwalks right now. A lot of that has to do with the weather. The reason for the catwalk is so that the keeper could continue to get out there when waves are crashing over the pier um, in storms and what have you to make sure that that lamp continued to be lit. Many of them obviously have converted to electric, so those catwalks really now don't serve the same purpose, uh, but it was a safety issue for the, the keeper of the light. The first Michigan lighthouse was actually Fort Gratiot Light, uh, commissioned in 1825. So again, right around that same time as we start seeing those other civil engineering projects uh, taken off with the canals and the locks. Of course, with uh, the geology being the way that it is, um, the weather being the way that it is here in the Great Lakes, uh, a lot of shipwrecks do happen. There's a lot of boats traveling, so that increase in traffic is also going to increase accidents. Uh, we could see the same thing in, uh, in cars on the road. So we have 6,000 plus shipwrecks in the Great Lakes. It's hard to put a specific number on it because not all of them, uh, have, one have been found or were recorded in the first place. Um, all types of vessels throughout history, uh, there are shipwrecks for in the Great Lakes. And that just makes sense. Um, we do have that unique environment, as I said, um, the depth of the Great Lakes, much of which is very shallow, the, it's narrow, uh, the behavior of the water here as it interacts with the weather uh, is kind of a unique uh, situation that potentially can be dangerous for vessels. Um, again, weather is the most common reason for shipwrecks. Uh, we didn't have the predictive technology that we do uh, now. So boats are going out, looks great in the morning, a uh, storm comes up. And if you've lived here in Michigan, you know how quickly that can happen. <laughs> um, and it's not always easy to predict even when we do have uh, the predictive technology that we do right now. So there's not a lot of wiggle room when you get off course. Um, you know, you are at the mercy of, uh, of the water and the wind. So there is a lot of uh, shipwrecks as a result of weather. Um, there's also fires that uh, happen aboard, certainly steamships um, and wooden vessels of any kind. We have collisions. Sometimes weather is uh, involved in that as well, fog specifically. Um, so there's, there's human error as well. Uh, there's always bound to be a little bit of that. So um, those are some reasons why we have uh, all the shipwrecks that we do. You can see quite a few from this map from the Michigan Shipwreck Research Association of Lake Michigan. Most of those shipwrecks are all relatively close to the shore. So there's, uh, it, it's a shallow factor. It's a not getting too far out in the lake factor. It's a weather factor that pushed you close to the shore. So we can see a lot of them there. And of course, what we know about. So there's, there's that element as well. Um, shipwrecks are really, really well preserved in the Great Lakes. We have very cold, fresh water. Um, so it sort of acts like a refrigerator uh, for Great Lakes. Unlike the oceans, we don't have the salt that corrodes the metal in the same way. We don't have those nice little critters that like to get in there and eat the, eat the wood. Um, we'll struggle a little bit with zebra and quagga mussels uh, on shipwrecks now. A lot of them are covered, so it does make it hard to, to see, and they, they do damage the, the wood and the metal. Um, but they really are time capsules of history, so we can, we can 
really understand one, the wrecking event, but also tells us a little bit more about who we are, where we came from here on the Great Lakes. So um, most of the Great Lakes around Michigan are in underwater preserves. Uh, it is illegal to take things off of shipwrecks. Uh, shipwrecks are owned by the state of Michigan uh, on, the, on the bottom lands. Um, and it's just so much better to be able to see those shipwrecks in their environment with all of those pieces. It tells a story. Uh, as soon as we start removing pieces of the shipwreck or artifacts off the shipwreck, that story changes and scientists don't get the full story. Uh, I think technology is going to continue to advance and more and more people will be able to access these sites even virtually. Um, that's happening even now. Uh, so not everybody has to be a diver in order to see these shipwrecks, many of which you can see are very shallow. So there's a great opportunity to, uh, you can kayak over the top of them. There's glass bottom boat tours. So there's a lot of ways to get out there and uh, see shipwrecks underwater. So that's the, that's the motto of uh, the diver, of the, the responsible diver in the Great Lakes is take only pictures, leave only bubbles. Here are some examples. Uh, we have shipwrecks on the beach. Um, one up in Ludington not that long ago that was recorded. They get covered and uncovered. It's a very dynamic uh, environment here in the Great Lakes. The city of Green Bay, actually, that you can see in the upper right, that, that decided to go on a walkabout earlier this year and is about half a mile away from where it has been for over 100 years. Um, that's not common for shipwrecks to move like that, but that tells you how dynamic the environment and the water has been uh, lately. All right, so Michigan Maritime Museum. I know I got to wrap it up here uh, pretty soon. So you can see this is our campus uh, here. The Maritime Museum kind of hugs the uh, heart of the Maritime District. So you can see Evelyn S, the commercial fish tug, all the way over on the left. We come all the way around, and now we own that property with those really cool um, Jensen buildings. We don't we don't own Captain Lou's. If you're familiar with uh, Bar and Grill Captain Lou's, we're uh, great. To, we're very excited to be able to have them there and send people over there for lunch uh, so they can come back and then get on their boat. Um, with the tent area there, we just laid sod on this uh, property this year, uh, fixed a lot of the shoreline from high water damage. Um, you can see our tall ship Friends Goodwill there in the picture, Lindy Lou, Bernita, our Coast Guard boat, uh, Chris Crasso, all right there in front of our Padnos boat shed building. The white building with the red roof is our Coast Guard exhibit and tucked away behind the trees there uh, is actually our current facility uh, and the main building for the Michigan Maritime Museum. So here's a little bit closer to our exhibits. Evelyn S, the fish tug, our Coast Guard exhibit. Padnos is going to be really hopping here in the fall as this is where we do the repairs and maintenance for all of our on-water fleet. Um, we have Lake Michigan's Call to Duty is our current main exhibit, all about the role that Lake Michigan played during World War II. Uh, we will be operating that exhibit in this facility until September 6th. Um, then we're going to be tearing this building down. Uh, we are in the middle of a big capital campaign uh, for a new facility, and I'll show you that in just a second. Um, our small craft uh, and antique outboard motor exhibit is coming, so that will likely open um, next year, if not you know, later this fall, but we probably will be closed. Um, we've got a lot of antique uh, outboard motors, so we really are looking forward to putting them back on display. You can see our on-water fleet uh, there again. Uh, every one of the vessels that we have is a historic or historic replica, and we take people out on the water um, each each summer. Uh, we want you to experience a little bit of history uh, firsthand as you can step on those uh, vessels. Okay, so launching a legacy. This is our capital campaign. Remember, I told you we just had a little building nestled in the trees. Um, well, now we can see this big old building. So we're going from about 4,500 square feet to just over 17,000 square feet of a two-story structure. Um, we're thrilled that we are, uh, we've raised over half of the money that we uh, need for a $8 million capital campaign. We purchased that property next door. So that's phase two. Phase one is to build this building. We'll be able to be year round. We'll be able to do tons more of these kinds of lecture things, but maybe in person in a larger space. We'll have a classroom as well um, that we can host kids at, which I'm, I'm very excited about because uh, I haven't been able to put 30 kids in one space ever. <laughs> so it'll be a real nice change for me um, with our education programs. Lots more exhibits. As I said, our first exhibit is going to be um, 
the golden age of steamship passenger travel. Uh, so we're really excited to be able to launch that. Um, so lots of develop happening on the campus. Uh, we love for your support. Come out and see us if you want to enjoy the exhibits here at the Michigan Maritime Museum right now. Um, I encourage you to do so uh, before the 6th of September. This is what the uh, two story building is going to end up looking like uh, here. So pretty impressive. Uh, we are, like I said, more than excited about it. And the, so that we can be the best museum that we can be. You can follow us on social media. We'd love to have your support uh, there. And we'll be posting updates about the project and anything else we're working on as well. Uh, we currently, uh, this Friday, we have our Make a Splash with Trash event that is in collaboration with the South Haven Center for the Arts. We're going to go do a stewardship beach cleanup and then we're going to bring that material back and with the help of a couple of local artists, we're going to make some art out of the uh, stuff that we find there on the beach. So it's a free event. We'd love to have you guys join us. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate you watching here today. And uh, I am open for any questions that you may have. That was great, Ashley. Thank you. Yeah, if you have any comments, you, you do have the ability to unmute yourself. Uh, we can't all speak at once, but please, please feel free to turn your camera on and uh, ask any questions you might have. You can also type questions or comments in the chat uh, someone rang in here said thank you, Ashley, for the program. Very cool. Uh, I I was I'll jump in uh, to start things off. I was really excited to see the uh, to hear your updates about the projects that you have going at. Uh, in South Haven uh, on your campus there. It's a really beautiful uh, new building that you've got in the works and sounds like is happening, moving along quickly. When will the, when, when will the new building open? What is the, the estimates that you have for that? Well, we are, uh, we're gonna be tearing this building down, I think starting the week of the 13th um, of September. And then if everything goes to schedule, we're hoping to open Memorial weekend or very early, you know, summer, early June, uh, 2022. Wow. So it's an aggressive timeline, but uh, we don't want to miss out on anything, uh, you know, here as certainly coming off of COVID year. Um, we want to make sure that uh, we can continue to operate our vessels. And uh, so I, we're, we're going to push real hard um, to make that ready, so. Great. All right, I see two questions in the chat. Uh, the first one is, uh, when did invasive species start showing up in the Great Lakes? That is a really good question. I don't, I don't know if I could put, uh, you know, a, a solid year on that or a series of years. I would say, um, Kind of what I've been reading is even even as early as the 1920s, we start seeing some some invasive species. But I I would think we're we're looking at when those when those boats are coming over um, with larger cargoes and then dropping that ballast and then they're making their way into you know other other places as it just kind of rides around the lake. So uh, I know in the in the 40s they still were they had problems with lamprey and then that really I think exploded a little bit more in the 50s and just kept getting worse. Zebra mussels um, really, I think, ended up being more in the, started coming in maybe in the 80s, I want to say, um, and then really started to take over really, really fast. So it just, uh, it depends on which, which one we're talking about uh, there, but um, earlier than you think. <laughs> Great. Another question in the chat, has erosion had an impact on the museum's activities? by that maybe high water is an erosion. Yes. <laughs> um, we lost about five foot of shore on the west end of our campus. Um, there was high water and flooding in areas where we've had um, parts of our boat show before. Um, we have kind of a, we call it the fish tug stage. Uh, that has a, a very mini kind of amphitheater. We couldn't do anything in there because it was flooded. Um, we had erosion along the entire shore. 
uh, that we've had to put revetment and armor stone uh, on. We've been really lucky to have some in-kind donations of services and materials in order to make that happen because all of that happened after the budget for the campaign. So um, it was outside of that $8 million and you know that's a lot of money <laughs> to, to then go back and ask for. So we've been really lucky. Um, the, the Jensen property has suffered from flooding for the last couple of years now. Um, we've had to close our antique and outboard motor exhibit, I think for the last two years, because people couldn't get there uh, because they'd have to walk through you know, at least six inches, sometimes a foot of water. Um, we had to mitigate some of that within the, that collection to make sure everything was up off the floor and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So I think it's impacted some activities. Um, we uh, much more maybe on that part of the campus. A lot of where we set right now is uh, a little bit higher um, outside of the floodplain, but um, we, we've had to make you know, changes in order to make sure power was up on our docks um, and not in the water for our vessels, um, changing and, and building whole structures so that people could access our vessels because they were so much higher. Um, and it's just very strange and, and different from 2013 when waters were at like record lows. <laughs> um, and we had to make changes then too. So it it's just, you know, you just have to, you just have to do it. Um, and you work around it and you work with it. Um, I looked at it as an educational opportunity for us. We, you know, during our camp, we talked about erosion. We talked about why erosion was happening, why the lakes might be high, the changes in the lakes, those kinds of things. So um, I think uh, in, in some ways we, when life hands you lemons, you make lemonade. Um, and uh, we were able to uh, come through that and, and in, a, in a positive way. It, it, we were able to actually do some of the work for phase two of the campaign uh, got taken care of because of the high water that situation that we had to deal with. So um, it, our timeline kind of shifted around and priorities shifted around a little bit. So we have a wonderful team of people, a wonderful board um, that can help us kind of come together and think of really creative solutions to handle any of those problems. So it did have some act uh, impact on our activities, uh, but mostly we overcame those and we're able to continue to operate those activities. Great, thank you. Other questions or comments from uh, from our audience here? Thank you so much, Ashley and Eric. This was a great program. I am thrilled to see this as well as my father back in the day was a an underwater photographer for the Smithsonian. And he always talked about, I know he always talked about uh, hoping to dive in Lake Michigan, but sadly, that did not that did not happen but thank you so much for preserving this great information i appreciate all of it thank you thank you thank you thank you very much well, all right uh, i want to thank everyone for coming to the program today uh, this will be available on YouTube uh, probably later this week, as well as a number of other programs related to Great Lakes history and maritime history uh, over the last couple of years. So uh, do check, uh, do visit our website and uh, our YouTube channel, Bob's History Center. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Ashley. And uh, everyone enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, we do have a couple of additional programs again. Next week, we'll be meeting in person uh, for our Tuesday talk on Saga Tech artist John Polka. Artist talk with Jason Pigno, being being in the Anishinaabe in the contemporary world this Thursday at 7 p.m. in the opening century of progress on September.